Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, the redistricting process kicks off as state leaders appoint representatives to draw new political boundaries. With unexpected budget surpluses, the legislature considers numerous funding requests. And in Washington, Utah's leaders propose a scaled down COVID relief package while they prepare for Trump's second impeachment trial. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Kate Bradshaw, Director of Government Affairs at Holland and Hart and Bountiful City Councilwoman. Katie McKellar, political reporter with Desert News and Spencer Stokes, president of Stokes Strategies. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're in the middle of the legislative session. Uh, a lot of things have happened. We're gonna talk about some bills today, but Spencer, I wanna start with the budget. I mean, it's an interesting thing to start with, but you can tell what people prioritize by what they put their money in. This has been a big year with our legislature for education. Well, the base budget's been passed. We have a lot more money than I think most people thought we would have, uh, and really record uh, for the rest of the country. Uh, you know, I, I deal with a lot of national folks, and they can't believe how well the state of Utah has managed the budget. But education, clearly uh, a big winner. Uh, teachers who have been really on the front lines of the, the pandemic getting a $1,500 bonus. So the base budget's done, and I, and I do believe that you're also going to see a tax decrease, a tax cut uh, for for older Utahns. And so I, I look, you have to commend the legislature. You have to commend how they've handled the pandemic and trying to balance uh, you know, public health with keeping businesses open. It was a fine line to walk, but they kept the economy going, and I think it's paid off in this session. Yeah, Katie, uh, to, to a couple of these great points that Spencer mentioned, uh, t teachers, there's this, the stipend, but there's also money being put in for the students have fallen behind during this, this COVID crisis. Right, and, and the 6% WPU increase, which was um, lawmakers, when they passed those base budgets, they called those that early infusion of cash for education historic. I don't think um, they talked about how it's just not something you see uh, that big of an investment, a big boost for education that early in the session. Usually those are types of things lawmakers debate late into the session. So mm -hmm. I think it was a big show of commitment from legislators saying, look, we are pri prioritizing education where we're prioritizing it big this mm -hmm. year. As you're doing your reporting, are people feeling like this was a promise kept? Because our legislature talked to the educators about doing this. We had a, a constitutional Amendment, amendment to get to this. How are, the, how are people feeling about that, that you're interviewing? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think if they didn't keep those commitments, I think there would have been a lot of big red flags for people. Uh, amendment G um, was put on the ballot with these uh, promises that, that lawmakers would prioritize education, that there wouldn't be any tricks, that this would be used for education and not to free up money to put it elsewhere. And so I think lawmakers are trying to walk that walk and, and showing early on that, that we really do prioritize education. Mm -hmm. Kate, uh, it's always interesting at this time of the legislative session where you start seeing all the requests. Uh, yesterday was a big day for people coming up on the Hill asking for certain amounts of money that will continue in the next week. What are you seeing out there and what kind of issues seem to be catching the attention of legislators? By far the biggest category of bills is, is law enforcement. There is a lot of uh, bills dealing with kind of what we saw in 2020, uh, nationally as well as, as in Utah. So that is a very big category uh, of bills. There are a lot of appropriations requests, and this is that, that final time to get those requests in so that they can be considered in the process. Uh, there are uh, a lot of one-time funding uh, options available, and um, so you've, you've seen some requests come in for those. Uh, as Spencer mentioned, there are a number of different tax bills that are being included for consideration, whether we should exempt Social Security tax, uh, Social Security uh, income, um, whether or not uh, we should increase the dependent care exemption. Uh, there was an interesting discussion about whether uh, PPP loans ought to be taxed. It looks like maybe that is not going to be something that's considered. Uh, and then, the, and of course, and across the board, maybe uh, rate cut on personal income tax. Those are 
all part of this funding mix that's that's being considered right now. Mm -hmm. Ms. Spencer, before we leave the budget there, it's just interesting, you know, a lot of people think that it, just government operations that are being considered here, but there's a lot of things impacting economic development. Oh, in the state. No question. You know, from, from film incentive to the Leonardo to, you know, many organizations come to the legislature and ask for some one-time funding. And it's always fun if you want a, a, a morning filled with uh, kicks and giggles, go, go to the legislative uh, web page, which is very robust. Look at the calendar. Click on the Beetle Business uh, Economic Development Labor. Go, go click on that and listen to that and see what organizations are coming before the legislature for funding. But I just love. I, I agree with you 100%, Katie, about there were promises that needed to be kept to public education. And those are going to have, you know, that will be, they'll need to be vigilant education to make sure those promises continue to be kept. But I don't know if it was on purpose or just by accident that they did not pick a, a letter that f fit into the letter grades you get in school. They picked Constitutional Amendment G. You know, if it had been C, D, or F, that would have been a problem <laughs> when sorry. talking about education. Yeah, they probably could have picked A. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That would have been better. Thought about that. Let's get a couple of these bills, uh, Katie, because Kate mentioned uh, the police reform. Big topic of discussion. This whole last year, as we saw, we saw people, you know, protesting in various places. Um, give us a couple of views of there's at least three bills that are supported by the speaker himself. Right. House Speaker earlier this week talked about how he has, has thrown support behind some of these bills that have found early favor um, with lawmakers through committees. Um, Representative Romero's bill uh, to require uh, use of force incidents to be reported to a statewide or a statewide and federal database mm -hmm. to get more data so we can learn more about what causes these use of force incidents. I mean, the Speaker talked about these these bills to, sh to show like these are easy steps we can make yeah. to um, progress on these issues. Uh, but there are dozens of other bills to require um, maybe tri trickier ref reforms that Speaker Wilson was not yeah. specific I, about. I will tell you, I think, Jason, if there, and I can't say this all the time about the Utah legislature, but if you were going to really try to walk uh, a compromise line in police reform, Utah, I think, is uniquely positioned to do that. They're very, very supportive, obviously, of law enforcement, and yet they're they're embracing some of these reforms. And I think you end up you'll end up in Utah with some things that would be a decent compromise when it comes to law enforcement. You know, it's difficult to be uh, on the streets nowadays and in the law and in law enforcement. And so, you know, walking the line of being supportive yet understanding there needs to be some reform is important and not just turning a blind eye to, well, we're going to just 100% law you know, right, support right, law enforcement. Right. So I think they've right. done a great job in walking that line. The other one was Representative Romero's bill to require 16 hours of de-escalation yes. training. Um, and so that was kind of, I think, an easy step since uh, law enforcement already needs to do 40 hours a year mm -hmm. on, on training. And so, uh, but some other bills that we saw that stalled um, in some committee last night was Civilian Review Board or Civilian Over oversight board by Representative Wheatley um, to allow local uh, cities to, to do that, um, to, to set up a, an oversight board. That was not something um, that found favor with the Ho House Law Enforcement Committee. Um, they, some lawmakers expressed concerns about allowing these cities to create these, these boards that would have, be at odds with um, what they say cities already have the power to do, which is, you know, uh, oversee police budgets and stuff like that. So that was another one that is having difficulty uh, moving forward. Before we leave this, Kate, uh, particularly as an elected official yourself, not only are they talking about these law enforcement, but there's even a bill to protect uh, protests at private residence, uh, trying to get to things where we saw even this last year, people showing up at the governor's house, you know, the district attorney's uh, house as well. Talk about that. And answer this correctly, Kate, because I've got signs already made to come to your house. So <laughs> he wants a misdemeanor, maybe. That's true. I know I, you know where my house is, so I, I should I should be prepared. Uh, you know, this is an interesting issue. Um, and it's one that uh, there was a member of the of the governor's transition team that happens to live in my city. And she uh, felt quite strongly about this issue after watching it play out with Dr. Dunn and the and uh, then Lieutenant Governor Cox. And she asked, does does Bountiful have an ordinance like uh, for picketing like like Salt Lake City does and some of these other places? And in checking it out, the answer was no, we don't. We've we've we haven't had this come up, but it could. You know, the 
the next Dr. Dunn could be a resident of my city or or some other city, you know, Panguitch. Um, so it was one that uh, as we looked at it, we thought, you know, maybe it has some, some statewide applicability. And so they took it to uh, the Chiefs of Police Association. They took this issue to the League of Cities and Towns to, to look at it. Um, and it's one of those things where I think, you know, the, the right to peaceably assemble, the right to um, let your elected officials know that you have some concerns is an important right to protect. But it, it's also one where I think we need to look at how, how you protect the other people in that household, um, spouses and children that are, that are not elected and therefore uh, the decisions aren't up to them. And, and so I, I think this is a bill I'm interested in, in personally seeing uh, move through the process so that we have a uniform application. I, I do think there's a difference between an elected official and a person who works for the state. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was the thing that was most troubling to me. Um, uh, you know, elected officials sign up for this, and, and I do want to have the best elect of, elected officials that we can, and I, I know that becomes kind of a deterrent to whether or not you want to run for office if you're going to have protesters. However, you sign up for that to be an elected official. As opposed to Angela Dunn, who is an appointed person doing, doing a job, and to have protesters show up at her house, that was the part that was troubling for me. Show up at the governor's mansion all, all you want. Our offices are right across the street. That's we true. saw the protesters. They were either getting honks or yelled at as uh, was going, you know, the protest was going on. But I see that there's a big difference between the two. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Kate, I want to start with you about this bill that came out yesterday because it's something that's starting to get a whole lot of attention in the state from our legislature, but also national sporting uh, associations. Uh, Representative Berkland brought this bill out yesterday, preserving sports for female students. You're a former student athlete. Uh, talk about this bill a little bit because we got to talk about uh, the sides of this one because it's about to get you know really prominent. Yes, back back in the the glory days, uh, I, I played um, basketball and volleyball for Westminster College, and played for my alma mater, Bountiful High. And I know Representative Berkland feels strongly about um, sports. She she's a referee for high school games. Um, she's a she's a coach as well for a girls basketball. And it's it's a it's an issue that um, is is one that I think will generate a lot of interest from folks. Um, you know, women's sports have, have had an interesting path, you know, thanks to Title IX. Um, and it was one where, when this bill came out, I went and looked up the, uh, the current standards that the High School Activities Association has in place. And I, I also then thought, well, what does the Olympic Committee, for instance, have in place? And looked those, those up. And it does seem that Representative Berkland's bill would take us in a different direction than these other sporting organizations have, have, have set their, their current standards at, which is that um, for some, someone that is uh, wanting to participate in girls' sports that is, that is transgender, that they would need to undergo a year of, of basically hormone-suppressing uh, medication so that uh, the, the playing field was leveled. Um, Representative Berkland's bill would, would, would instead very strictly say, you, you play the sport of the gender you were assigned at birth. Um, it's, it's one of those that's going to be emotionally fraught, I think, uh, for those, those uh, girls that are playing sports, those transgender athletes that are uh, you know, looking for a place to compete and looking for acceptance as well. Uh, you know, my personal opinion is probably that uh, following these uh, other organizations, so there's a consistency from whether you're playing at a high school level to a college level to an Olympic level, makes a lot of sense so that there would always be something that is consistent that the athlete could look to and know as they uh, are looking at how they want to compete and where they want to compete and where they best can do so. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the state lawmakers are... Um, adept at doing a lot of things and and looking at public policy in a lot of areas. This is one where I, I don't think they are adept at looking at. I think there's going to be a lot of emotion surrounding it. And I would, I'd prefer to see them leave it in the hands of the Utah High School Student Activities Association, yeah. the Olympic Committee, the NCAA, uh, Pac-12, whatever the, the sporting organizations are, because I think they've got a pretty good handle on it. And I don't think it's a widespread issue. And so why why elevate it to um, to that level? I, I Look, I'm... I hate messaging bills, and it it tends to feel like this is a little bit of a messaging bill. And so I, I'd say we let's let the sports 
folks it, deal with it. It will tee up a really emotional uh, conversation on the Hill. I mean, with uh, Rep Representative Berkland talking about this needs to preserve fairness in women's sports, but on the other side, Troy Williams from Equality Utah talks about how this could really harm the LGBT community, transgender community, mm -hmm. um, feel, make them feel excluded from things that regular other like other people get to enjoy like uh, high school sports and so um, I think it, it if they're gonna tackle this it's gonna be a really fraught issue mm -hmm. uh, Spencer to your point um, this, we have some of our elected officials that are even talking about this at the federal level Mitt Romney mm -hmm. uh, seems to uh, agree with the with the principles so does Mike Lee but there is the other side that we we're just getting to as well which is some of the business community for example about the message that sends apart from the policy because uh, some of these like the NCAA, for example, might have some things to say about what they're, what they're willing to do in the state. Is this true well, or is it? No, I, I agree 100 percent. I, I just feel like um, in the world of politics, I think our elected officials should know what what they have the knowledge to deal with and what they don't have the knowledge to deal with. And this is one of those areas where we have a lot of seasoned professionals who deal with this every day. And, you know, we, as Republicans, we like to say government is best, which is closest to the people. This is one of those things which I think should be dealt with closest to the people, which are the Utah High School Student Activities Association deals with all the, this all the time. Um, and how, how do you use this as a fairness issue? I, I mean, we have a lot of women who want to play football, for example, on the high school football team. I think the first field goal was kicked by a female uh, NFL player. I, I Check me if that's my, my area is not sports, but, but uh, you know, the, where do you draw the line? When does government interference uh, in these kinds of things end and begin? Mm -hmm. And I think we ought to stick with public policy uh, at the local level, at these local levels, so. All right. Uh, let's I would agree with Spencer that, that you know, the, the expertise to deal with this, the medical relevance to deal with this, it may not rest in the legislature in the, you know, we're almost to the halfway mark. So, you know, in the, in the 20 or so plus days they've got to deal with this, do we have the medical expertise to, to wade into this very deep issue? Whereas these other sporting organizations, do have that uh, those medical resources and have already started that research um, and have set levels do is this the right thing we, for the state of Utah to wade into we need to bolster a society that believes in facts and lets experts deal with things we we saw this at the very beginning of the pandemic and I think you know, while there was a role for public policy and lawmakers and politicians to be involved in, I think largely we missed the boat in the very beginning because we didn't rely solely on experts. And we probably could have curbed or stemmed the tide in the very beginning had we listened to experts. Uh, and this is one of those areas I feel that's important. I mean, we've, we're, how, how many more times can you undermine uh, institutions that base things on fact and uh, this is one of those areas I believe we should stick to experts and I think that's best handled at that level. Mm -hmm. Before I leave the legislative session I just have to have one it's a quick one for you all right is Dixie State University gonna get a name change all right just the vote okay went through the house say yes what do you all think just really quick is gonna change yes I we got a yes going to. yes Kate yeah. Ooh, you know, there's the, the, there's a little hold up in the in the Senate. Uh, I I think that uh, perhaps a, a, an agreement can be reached there. Uh, I think it's personal. My personal opinion is it's probably time for that change to happen, and I think it hurts um, the alumni and the current students and their uh, ability to go on to earn other degrees and to have people question their resume. So I, I hope we're ready to do it, but I think it's it's still got a little bit of a, a hurdle to yeah. get through. Speaker Wilson came out pretty early as a supporter of yeah. naming that change. We do see some Senate leadership kind of being a little yeah. bit more. We need to discuss this more. The process needs to play out. The, the Senate did. The Senate is the problem. Um, as, as always, the Senate's a little more traditional, mm -hmm. but I think they made an amendment. Representative Last made an amendment to call it the Dixie Campus. Um, th th this has... This has bigger implications, quite frankly, because once this happens, 
you know, what do they do with the red rock that says Dixie on the side of it? Do, does, do we, do we, yeah, do we get a Sharpie and go try to find the red that matches it and, and uh, paint it out? So, uh, but the compromise of Dixie campus, I think is something that, you know, I didn't like it when they changed the state song from Utah, we love thee to uh, the, the new Kurt Bester, you know, version. So I'm kind of a traditionalist in that, but this is one that needs to change. You know, okay. I, I went to Dixie and I was there through their whole identity crisis early on um, when they they well they they changed from a college to a university that was an opportunity to change the name and they didn't but we're seeing because it's come back as a conversation it, it's painful again and so I mean I think the question is if they don't do it are they gonna have to grapple with this issue down the road and is it gonna be even more painful mm -hmm. it's not going away it mm -hmm. is definitely not uh, but I'll tell you what is back Kate redistricting I know our elected officials love this. T just really quickly, I want to talk about this. We have our newly appointed members of the redistricting commission, something the voters voted on. They want to put these in place. Tell us a little bit about the makeup of it and what their timelines are, because they have to start almost immediately putting together some new district lines. Yeah, that is true. And, and we have a, a big hang up and that hang up is we don't have the data yet. Uh, you know, the census was delayed. Um, the, we don't know when they'll actually have the raw numbers to work with, but they're gonna start, I think, the process in order to meet those timelines so that they can uh, adopt those new district maps. Uh, you know, we had an, a, a, a ballot issue that passed uh, two years ago that has set up a new independent redistricting commission. Uh, there were people that were nominated from uh, the, the state house, the state senate, the governor, um, and so we have this new group. We're going to try it this new way. There will also be a legislative committee that will that will move this uh, process as, as well in, in adjusting these maps. And there are congressional maps, our school board maps, our legislative maps. Um, you know, personally, my uh, my home county of Davis County has been uh, divided between two congressional districts. We're half in the first and half in the second congressional district. I think you know, that does a disservice to my community uh, to be divided in that way. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to sharing my thoughts with, with both the legislative group and the independent group on, on what's important in terms of representation for my community. So, so Spencer, are we going to see big changes? I mean, you've, you've run campaigns. You've worked on these things with these yeah, members. It, it, I will tell you that the thing I'm most heartened by is that the, the legislature left in place. It's an advisory, an advisory commission. They'll come back with some ideas. But I am so impressed with the seriousness with which they made the appointments. They are, it's a, a, a solid rock star group of seven people from the chair all the way down to the Republican appointments and the Democrat appointments. So it's going to have some gravitas as it makes its presentation to the redistricting committee. And, and Kate, I would argue you're better served by having two Congress persons uh, because you, you now have two people. You have two votes for Bountiful City. In some ways, yes, but in some ways, you know, we are we are paired with uh, communities that are far off the Wasatch Front. And, and, you know, we have a lot more in common, I would say, in Davis County with Weaver County, in Southern Davis County, where I'm at in Bountiful, than, than we might have with, uh, you know, folks in in uh, Iron County but, or but this, uh, Jason, Weaver County. This just shows you how fraught redistricting yes. is because everybody's got an opinion on how it should be done. Kate has her opinion. I have my opinion. Katie will have hers. You'll have yours. So it is a difficult process. The House and Senate chair, Paul Ray in the House and Scott Sandel uh, in, in the Senate. If anything, you could say that the boundaries were drawn up for Northern Utah. <laughs> okay, we'll watch that because we have a chance to participate. We'll have seven public meetings by August. People will be able to participate. Maybe we'll submit our maps and we'll see what the legislature does with those. And a lot of elected officials are watching. You know, maybe some yeah. that want to jump in to see what those, those boundaries look like. Really quickly before I leave, uh, Katie, a lot happening in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, right now uh, with you know, the Republican Party trying to take care of its own members in some way mm -hmm. or not, as the case may be. But talk about what's happening in terms of uh, the, the impeachment proceedings and how that's relating to members of the own Republican body that maybe are being disciplined by the other side. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to have to see. Uh, we saw our own senators, uh, Mike Lee and and Mitt Romney disagree on whether the, the impeachment proceedings are constitutional. Um, so here, even in Utah, we're seeing divisive um, opinions about what to do uh, with former President Donald Trump. Um, and so I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I think uh, na nationwide Democrats are kind of starting on this, uh, this, this, 
this kind of this point where they have to decide if, if they really want to be truly bipartisan um, or if, you know, as if they look toward um, COVID relief, are they going to work with Republicans who um, have brought forth a, maybe a smaller package than what, what Biden wants? And yeah. so it'll be interesting to I, see what happens. We saw the vice president cast, uh, and I don't know if you've been paying attention to the number of votes, but, but there have been a lot of tie votes that have failed. Vice president cast a vote on budget reconciliation which is how they're going to do the COVID relief and it really is determining whether or not there's going to be bipartisan support and I I take my cue on the impeachment from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court if he's unwilling to come over and be and sit in the chair to preside over the trial it says a lot and he's not it's mm -hmm. not in my mind he he really is making the statement there uh, Spencer, in our last 30 seconds here, uh, you've worked in Washington, D.C. Are there any signs that there's some kind of bridge being built right here uh, as what people thought might happen after the election? You know, sadly, I think that the disarray that the Republican Party's in is going to last for a, another year or so, but you can't sustain it when you have a group of 10 senators that are trying to compromise with the Democrats and the other senators that are not, so. All right. Thank you for your insight. So helpful. Can't wait to see what happens during this legislation session. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.